Hello everyone, my name is Tinder Asala, and today I want to present to you part of my dissertation, which I defended at UNC Chapel Hill this last December. The title of this presentation is Magical Religious Coins in Ancient Synagogues. Now, the dissertation as a whole looks at all coin hoards that have been found in ancient synagogues from late antiquity. By this, I mean it is a database that gives an overview of all coin groups of four coins or more that were placed in or next to an ancient synagogue dating from the first century CE to the seventh century CE, predominantly within Israel, Palestine, and some in the diaspora. In total, I looked at 57 separate coin hoards or deposits, as I tried to neutrally call them, dispersed over 22 separate synagogue buildings, here shown on this map. In the dissertation, I indicate where in the building a deposit was found and in what archeological context, including as many maps and original photographs I could find. And I give detailed information on every single coin within a deposit. So the emperor, minting place and date, etc. Then in the second part of the dissertation, I organized each deposit with a specific functional category. In my opinion, there were seven reasons for why a coin deposit could have been added to the synagogue building. There were of course, accidental losses, but also votive offers or guinezot, charity hoards or tzedakah, treasuries, emergency hoards, post-destruction offerings and magical religious deposits. In this presentation today, however, I will only go deeper into that last and most enigmatic category, the magical religious deposits, more commonly known among ancient synagogue scholars as the foundation deposits. So what are we talking about for this category? In 14 separate synagogue buildings excavated by archeologists over the last century, coins have been found hidden either under the floor, behind the benches or inside the walls of the synagogue building at Dabie, Der Aziz, In Ashut, Harfat Kanaf, Kasrin, Bar'am, Merod, Koratzin, Kapurnaum, Harfat Kur, Harfat Samaka, and Gedi, Sardis, and Ostia. These coins were just found in closed off, irretrievable places within the structure. One cannot get to them without dismantling the building, indicating that they were meant to stay within the building as long as it stood. A second characteristic of these deposits is that the coins are found scattered over a large surface. In other words, they were not placed inside a container or a pouch, like for example, emergency hoards often were, but instead we find these coins sprinkled under, for example, the entire surface of the synagogue floor or across the entire length of the wall bench. Third, coin hoards like these contain a large number of coins. The most famous example is probably Capernaum, where between the 1960s and now, over 25,000 single coins have been found under the synagogue and the courtyard floor. The last two characteristics pertain to the coins themselves. In these kinds of hoards, the value of the coins themselves is low. Um, almost all the coins are small bronze minimi, and the coins in total have a long date range, indicating that they had been stored over a long period of time before their secondary deposition and that there were just not coins that one happened to have in hand at, this, at any given day, like for example, the coins in a charity hoard. So how can we interpret these deposits? What was their function? If one cannot easily get to this money, then why was it there? To be fair, I am not the first one who has ever asked these questions. Soon after the first groups of coins started to pop up at Capernaum in the late 1960s, People have been speculating about their function. Scholars like Avi Yuna, Tzvi Ilan, Donald Ariel, Gabriela Bechowski, and most recently Nili Ahipas, all looked at these peculiar deposits and tried to come up with an explanation. A more detailed overview could be found in my dissertation, but in short, most people have interpreted these deposits as foundation deposits. Foundation deposits, or building deposits, are groups of coins that were placed in the foundation of a building during its construction, forming an integral part of the structure of the building, but having neither a decorative nor a functional um, structural function. Their functional interpretation thus must lay in a symbolic or a spiritual world. And we know of these kinds of deposits from religious and secular buildings around the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean world, 
where texts talk about the various rituals involved with the construction of a building. And one step in the ritual was often the placement of precious materials in the foundations of the structure to both purify and bless the building and its users. Thus, according to many scholars, these coins are Jewish foundation deposits, which function in a similar way. However, based on my own research, I do not agree with this particular terminology. And here's why. The phenomenon of foundation deposits and the rituals surrounding the deposits um, is well known from texts originating in ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Assyria, Greece, and Rome. Based on analyses of these texts, I concluded that foundation rituals as a whole display certain commonalities, which help us to establish basic definitions for this particular phenomenon. For example, the placement of deposits was always part of an elaborate ritual with multiple steps to prepare the site for the construction of the building and dedicated priests or religious leaders oversaw the process according to strict guidelines. Foundation deposits normally consist of a variety of materials ranging from precious objects to figurines to ceramics and were almost always placed together in carefully selected spots such as under the threshold or the corners of a building. This does the, indeed not align with our synagogue deposits. First of all, it's important to note that we have no texts, Jewish or otherwise, that talk about our phenomenon. In contrast to, for example, ancient Assyria and Mesopotamia, where we have elaborate instructions for the ritual, we have no rabbinic or historical sources mentioning the insertion of coins or any other materials underneath a synagogue building. No texts were written with guidelines or examples of this practice, and no artistic depictions have been discovered illustrating it. And to be fair, it is true that we are not well informed on many what we would consider Jewish mag magical rituals, but in most cases, for example, for the writing of magical amulets by rabbis, we at least have hints at their existence. No such hints exist for a foundation ritual. Even if we do not follow this argumentum excellentio, perhaps because most rabbinic literature was formulated before this phenomenon started, which I think, according to my research, was some time in the second half of the fifth century CE. But even then, there are other arguments to consider. The deposits found under the floors of ancient synagogues, for example, do not contain a variety of materials. Despite careful excavation methods, including sifting, archeologists have not found other objects buried under a synagogue building. No gemstones or plaques or jewelry or ceramic vessels or tools, only coins. So why would Jews deviate from neighboring peoples in this regard? And why would specifically coins have been chosen and not, for example, small menorahs or other objects? Furthermore, as I already mentioned, coins as floor deposits also do not appear in specific locations placed together. Unlike Aramaic incantation balls, for example, coin deposits do not seem to have been placed carefully in certain strategic locations. And last, the coins in synagogues are usually found very high up, close to the surface of the floor, and not in deep pits or in the foundation trenches of a wall. Therefore, we might conclude that coin deposits of ancient synagogues are in fact not foundation deposits, but instead are a different phenomenon that is unique to ancient Judaism. So what are they? I believe the answer lies in a specific Jewish tradition. Floor coins were the tithing coins that had been saved by the local population and then deposited during the construction of the building to be able to dispose of sacred coins in a respectful way, to bless the building, to ward off the evil eye perhaps, and simultaneously making an offering to God. Tithing as a practice first appeared in the Torah, not as a commandment, but as a practice of the patriarchs. Later, God commanded Aaron the priest and Moses to give a tenth of their produce to be eaten to the Levi by the Levites. This tenth is called the Maaser Rishon, the first Maaser. As the tribe of Levi did not receive a portion of the land of Israel, these harvests would support them as they worked in the tabernacle or in the temple. The second Maaser, the Maaser Sheni, was a second tithe taken from the produce and it was supposed to be taken in kind to Jerusalem, where it was then eaten by the owner and his family while in a state of ritual purity. 
If one was unable to bring the produce to Jerusalem immediately, it could be redeemed by bringing an equivalent sum of money to Jerusalem and spending it there on food and drink. After the temple's destruction and the disappearance of temple priests and sacrifice in Jerusalem, however, this situation changed. Instead of bringing tithes to Jerusalem, Jews were now encouraged to burn the food or to kill the animals locally. However, for many farmers living after 70 CE, destroying so much food was unacceptable, and thus they often chose to redeem the food for money. However, because this money could then not be used to purchase food to eat in Jerusalem after 70, there were large numbers of coins of tithing coins that had to be kept out of circulation, as these coins were now earmarked as sacred. Thus, a whole field of Tanaitic law developed to deal with this money, including rules for hiding and discovering it. Over time, the goal of the second tithing changed from compensating real value money, the money needed by the pilgrim to purchase food in Jerusalem, to the permanent storage of large amounts of coins somewhere in the house, to a more or less symbolic act performed with small coins, a small coin as a part pro toto for the total Maasar Shini. In late antiquity, furthermore, when silver coinage became scarce at the end of the fourth century, the silver tied coin was replaced by a bronze coin. No longer able to utilize the biblical silver, bronze coins now became the symbolic representation of the harvest to be set aside and designated as sacred. And when money is earmarked as sacred, it is only a small step to connect the money to the other sacred place in the village, the synagogue. Through a detailed analysis and dating of the coins within the floor deposits, I was able to pinpoint the start of this peculiar phenomenon in the second half of the fifth century. And, and more details are in my dissertation if you wanna see how I came to that date. Now, what was going on at that time that could have instigated this? I believe there were several factors in play. First of all, when placing all the synagogues in which floor deposit have been found on a map, it becomes immediately clear that this was a Galilee Golan phenomenon. Inside the two synagogues in the diaspora, Ostia and Sardis, and a synagogue at Engedi, all other buildings are located around Lake Kinneret. What was it about Galilee and the Golan that prompted Jews to place tithing coins in their synagogues? What made this region so special? I believe that one reason might be that this area was a central hub for rabbinic studies during the third and fourth century, which undoubtedly left its traces throughout late antiquity. For example, many synagogue mosaic floors in this region, like the one at Hukok here shown, show the pictures of stories that do not appear in the Hebrew Bible, but do appear in rabbinic writings. And thus, while scholars currently believe that rabbis probably did not have much involvement with the synagogue life in late antiquity on a practical level, people living in this region were clearly familiar with the rabbinic sources. As Uzi Liebner stated in 2016, rabbinic literature, therefore, cannot be seen as a reflection of the world of a marginal and isolated elite only, but also contains many traditions that were shared with wider Jewish society. Thus, if the destruction or removal of the tithing coins from circulation is indeed a Tanaitic halachic tradition, as previously stated, Galilee could have been the ideal fertile ground for this new synagogue tr tradition to take root. A second process that was happening in the fifth century is a phenomenon coined by Stephen Fine as imitatio templi, or templization. As Fine states, the relation between synagogues and the temple became so basic to Jewish conceptions that sources go as far as to treat the biblical tabernacle as a kind of big synagogue, and the Ark of the Covenant as a Torah shrine. Probably further instigated by the rise of Christian sacred sound sites around the Galilee, churches and monasteries, Jews started to see their synagogue as a sacred site as well, becoming on par with the long lost temple. Thus, I believe that the floor deposit tradition was a result of a collective commemorative attitude towards the sacredness of the space and halachic choices concerning tithing sparked by particular groups in Northern Galilee and the Golan. I propose that since people felt a strong connection to their synagogue, and since synagogues in late antiquity started to more and more take over the functions of the temple, it would have only been a small step 
to a link the stored tithing coins to the synagogue, a space where people anticipated that God was more likely to interface with earthly spaces and its supplicants. This then explains why the coins are low in value. Throwing coins is a symbolic act to call upon the natural, the supernatural powers to manipulate the natural world, or in our case, to call upon God to protect the donors and the larger community. This also explains the long date range of the coins. Members of the community could have been setting apart the symbolic tithing coin for decades before a synagogue was constructed or renovated, which gave them the opportunity to add their collection to the building. Last, it also explains why the coins were scattered over a larger surface. According to rabbinic literature, congregational offerings, korbanot tzibur, were preferred over individual offerings, korbanot yahid. Congregational offerings were not only meant to be made on behalf of the community as a whole, but also by the entire community. Statements in the Mishnah already attest that it was preferred that tithing offerings made to the temple in kind were to be sold for money. In this way, standardizing the form of currency and thereby individual and the nations were unrecognizably swallowed into the anonymous greater repository of money over which the donor had no control. This offering similarly was made by no one in particular and would tie into our hypothesis about the scattering of the coins. Instead of each individual offering their own coins in a separate container, the coins were mixed and sprinkled under the floor of the building as a communal sacrifice. Placing the coins in the groundwork of the building, often fused in the mortar bedding of the floor itself, formed a so-called magical foundation for the building. Congregational sacrifices by the community were meant to maintain the prosperity and protection of the space and thereby the well-being of the community as a whole. In this way, this deposition of synagogue coins is perhaps giving us a rare glimpse into the activities of the common users of the synagogue buildings, a population frequently overlooked in ancient synagogue contexts. Donor inscriptions only refer to the people who were wealthy enough to make a substantial donation to the building. Sprinkling low value coins, however, could be done by people from any social or economic status. Thus, individuals of lower uh, social class could participate in this ritual as well, giving us a unique insight into the lives of the common people. Finally, if the floor deposits cannot be considered foundation deposits, then what should we call them? I propose the term magical religious coins. With this term, I indicate that the coins were brought in not as utilitarian tools, but as otherworldly instruments to obtain a metaphysical outcome as an integral part of Jewish religion. As Karen Stern also critiqued in her work on graffiti in the ancient synagogue, the divide made between magical devices and other common elements of the synagogue building is artificial. In her opinion, inscriptions and other apotropaic devices should not be isolated as magical per se, but instead should be included in the list of common ancient prayer activities that were once conducted inside the synagogue building. I believe the same can be said about the floor coins. Although the reasons behind the deposition may be personal and diverse, they were a common part of the magical aspects of Jewish religion. And so on this last slide, um, I would like to point out that my entire dissertation, including an overview of the other functional categories that I not talked about, a lot more maps, images, and plans, and a dozen interactive tables and graphs can all be found online on um, www.ancientsynagoguecoins.com. And here as well, you're able to download the spreadsheets of all 57 deposits um, where I analyze all the coins within those deposits if you would like to. And finally, um, feel free to reach out to me um, through my email or Twitter. Thank you very much. <laughs>